uh, this uh, uh, this uh, conference and uh, to talk to you about the work that uh, actually is funded by uh, Asia Connect uh, through the Team Corporation. So, so this uh, uh, project we started uh, about one and a half year ago, and the goal is uh, to develop a system which is cost effective and sustainable uh, to monitor air quality. And I'll talk more about the the, the, the work, but uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge my co-PI, Dr. Jahangir Kram, and my collaborator, uh, Dr. Ling from, uh, from Malaysia. Uh, so this is uh, also in partnership with the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan through the Pakistan Education and Research Network. Um, I am from LAMS, which is a university in the city of Lahore, which is the second largest city of Pakistan, but also called the heart of Pakistan because it has so much cultural and historical significance. Um, so, uh, so, so Pakistan and uh, this region uh, has been going through a major problem of air quality. And uh, the air quality problem, uh, of course, starts from somewhere in Afghanistan and goes all the way to, to Bangladesh, uh, I mean, passing India and Nepal also in between. Uh, and, and it's a transboundary issue, but so every country is, uh, is, is trying to uh, do something about it because this has just uh, have been accumulating for the past many years. Uh, but now the situation is that now uh, we have a fifth season called the smog season that starts uh, in November when the when the air uh, is heavy because of uh, the, the the cold season and uh, all the pollution that's just generating it just uh, uh, you can say trapped uh, underneath it and uh, because of that uh, I mean complicating the more situation there is. Uh, uh, this is the crop burning season. So, so a lot of uh, smoke comes out both sides of the border in India and Pakistan. Uh, and then of course there are brick kilns that are that also contribute. So, so there are there are multitude of uh, reasons why we are having this uh, uh, air, air quality issue. Uh, and nobody actually knows that what is the deep root cause of it. I mean, when you are in, uh, you can say that season or even throughout the year, you see all these uh, headlines uh, about the uh, most polluted city and the smog season and, and the air quality issues, um, but nobody knows what, what is going on. Uh, some people say that it is traffic that is contributing most to it. Some say this is industry, some say it's got crop burning, some say that it is one country and some say this is other country. So it's just, uh, it's a complicated situation. And um, the, the atmosphere is not good in those days. I mean, uh, these days we have the monsoons and, and the atmosphere is pretty, pretty clear, but uh, starting from November all the way until January or sometime into February, uh, the air quality problem has, is, is, is a major challenge uh, and, and a major impact on the quality and life of the people uh, in this region. Um, also, uh, this region uh, is uh, quite vulnerable to, to climate change. So not only the air quality that is, that is uh, uh, I mean, we are facing the trouble, the, the, the climate change is also uh, is, is a problem. But before I talk about climate change, this, uh, uh, I mean, some of the most polluted countries also lie in this region, some in India, some in Pakistan. And uh, this is a major health hazard, I mean, for an already vulnerable population. And uh, there is, of course, life expectancy uh, impacts, and there is a health impact. Um, there are deaths attributed to it. Although it's a kind of a very slow poison, so you do not see that impact, like uh, uh, what in case of an earthquake. But uh, um, this is since this is a small and and, and slow uh, poison. Uh, this is uh, although creating a lot of trouble, but in in the long term, especially to uh, more uh, you can say vulnerable deep sectional society like uh, small children or, or pregnant ladies uh, and elder people, and especially people who work outdoors. So, so all of them actually face uh, a lot of problem in this in this uh, season. And let me just tell you that the main reason uh, or, or the main contribution is the particulate matter, which is the very small particles that actually go into your uh, respiratory system and then they can be part of uh, uh, the, the, the blood circulation also. So, so that the very tiny particles that, uh, that create this problem. And you cannot see them from, from naked eye, but uh, uh, certainly these are, the, the sensors are, are there to, to record them. Now, uh, in terms of impact, uh, the in 2019, uh, we 
have seen that and estimate that there are about from the outdoor air pollution directly or indirectly 124,000 people have died. Uh, now this is a major number. I mean, if we look at the, just to compare it with the, with the COVID with that the world has gone through, the COVID number are, are not even a, a fraction of it. I mean, I mean, COVID, COVID has impacted, but now the impact has subsided. But even in the, in the, in the you can say apex of the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the number was not that high as we get from, from air, air pollution since because it is not, uh, you can say a very newsworthy uh, thing or something that uh, um, is not putting a burden on the hospitals, like in, like rows of people coming to hospital. That's why it's it's not getting that much significance as as COVID had. Now, to 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 make any uh, kind of uh, impact, uh, make any kind of uh, uh, you can say intervention for uh, the uh, improving air quality you first need uh, the air quality monitoring, the data that is coming from it to see that which are, what are the sources, what are the areas, what are the seasons, what is the constituent, there is the uh, source apportionment, apportionment uh, studies of uh, what uh, sources are uh, creating what kind of uh, air quality challenges. And um, this uh, is uh, of course a, a challenge because without uh, this data, uh, we can be just uh, consider ourselves as a blind surgeon on an operating table. I mean, the government can do this or that, but nobody really knows that what is uh, the impact of that because you do not have the data beforehand and you do not have the data afterwards. Uh, the only data monitoring that we have are few uh, stations that are uh, installed by the government, but those are those are challenges because the number is very low plus they have uh, maintenance issues uh, all the time. So what people have done uh, in the past few years is that they have, uh, you can say, community-based uh, monitoring has started. Uh, so for example, this uh, IQ Air is, uh, and Purple Air, there are two, uh, uh, two organizations that provide these sensors and people have voluntarily installed these sensors on private buildings like universities or even their, uh, on, their, on their houses. And there are about 20 or 30 of them. That's the best source of, uh, you can say, air quality monitoring uh, that, that we are getting at this point, other than the few government-grade sensors. Now, uh, our first project that we did in the real-time spatial, uh, and, the, and the title was Real-Time Spatial Temporal Emission Mapping, and that ran from uh, uh, last year, from January to December. And the goal is that to solve the challenge of spatial temporal uh, monitoring, um, sorry, solve the challenge of air quality monitoring, we should be doing something out of the box because I mean, whatever we do, probably the country cannot have 700 monitoring stations that needs to be installed because that's the number that experts say that that should be needed of a country of size, Pakistan and population density. Uh, so the goal was to develop a real-time system, uh, which uh, not only tell us about the, uh, the the impact, the air quality numbers, but it it uh, plans to do it in, in slightly different way. And I'll, I'll tell you that in in a second. Um, and then, of course, the main goal was to uh, to get the data so that we can help the government to do some kind of interventions. Um, what the idea was to divide the city. Uh, in form of a grid, uh, in form of a grid where every grid uh, box is has some sort of, uh, uh, you can say, identification that we associate to. And then we install uh, the air quality sensors on top of vehicles. And when the vehicles move, uh, the vehicle will, of course, be in one of those that the, the box in the grid. And uh, whatever reading it is giving out, uh, that reading will be stored and uh, at a website, and we assume that okay for that box we have the that kind of uh, air quality or uh, whatever the number of pm and and SOX and NOx are. Now, the idea was to install it on multiple vehicles. So when the vehicles move, and uh, the readings come out, and they come pretty frequently after every half a minute or so, uh, we just record that, and and in the end we have the most of this grid filled out with information that when that vehicle passed, what is the air quality numbers uh, at, at that time. Now, uh, and, and again, the, the, the goal was to have it uh, on public vehicles like buses, uh, so that because buses run around all the time and uh, we'll get 
data across space in this whole city and across time. So whenever the bus operating hours are. So that was the initial idea of uh, developing the system. We uh, developed uh, a whole architecture where uh, there are two kinds of sensors that we uh, plan to install. One were the stationary sensors for, you can say, calibration purposes and also for uh, getting kind of an ambient air quality uh, data. And then mobile sensors, which were installed on vehicles uh, and the data goes through the Pakistan Education Research Network and comes to uh, uh, a, a, a server at our university, and then it can be accessible to the public and of course to the government. So that was the, the idea. Um, and another challenge that we saw that in procuring the sense, and by the way, uh, before I forgot, these are the low cost sensors. So these are not, you can say the EPA grade sensors, which cost, I mean, a fortune, but these are a low cost sensor that can that you can buy in, in a relatively reasonable amount of money. Um, another thing was that uh, although some people have tried to use low cost sensors in Pakistan before, the challenge they faced was that whenever those sensors needed calibration, then they had to send it back to the, to, to the company where it came from. And then it, it's of course a whole shipping and taxes and duties and everything. And then the hassle of sending it back. So, so we saw that mostly for these uh, sensors, the life is just whatever the life for until the first calibration, and then the sensor is just gone. Uh, on top of that, there are other mechanic uh, maintenance issues. Uh, some sensors may be faulty, some maybe have some over voltage, under voltage, so different kind of challenges that uh, that that that's with sensor face. So, so what we tried to do to uh, uh, you can find out a vendor that can actually provide us these low cost sensors right here in the country. Fortunately, we, we got hold of a company. Uh, it's an IoT company based out of Karachi in Pakistan, and they developed this sensor. And the sensor that you see, it has three things. Uh, there's a box that has the, the sensor installed for measuring different uh, kind of pollutants. And then there is a battery and then the solar panel. So, so uh, even if, uh, uh, so, so it has to be charged uh, from the solar panel, but uh, if the solar panel is not available, you have a fixed location, uh, we can get electricity from various uh, uh, sources to, to power up this thing. Uh, another thing what we did differently was that mostly the sensors from IQ Air and Purple Air uh, monitor uh, only the particulate matter, uh, PM2.5 and PM10. Uh, although there are other pollutants in the air, we wanted to find out what is the uh, ozone or, or uh, sulfur or nitrogen uh, and, and carbon monoxide uh, in, in the air, what's the concentration of those gases? So, so we had those sensors installed also, and then temperature, humidity, as well as uh, the GPS, so that we know that where uh, the uh, vehicle is uh, at that particular location. Uh, so we developed the whole uh, air quality monitoring platform. Uh, we call it airlens.com. And uh, this uh, supposedly is uh, the, you can say the one-stop shop for measuring all the data, all the, the information there. Whatever data is coming, one can see, one can download, uh, publicly available, uh, nothing, uh, no, no kind of any restriction. Um, and we use the US uh, EPA method for developing the air quality index. Um, and uh, this was, of course, uh, very nice. We had all the, you can support already, and uh, the, all the platform was ready to roll out. Um, but then something happened. Uh, and I'll tell you what happened. But First, uh, let's see what we did in terms of dividing the regions. So the Lahore city uh, ha has an area of 700 uh, square kilometers. And uh, administratively, it is divided into nine zones that are further divided into 274 union councils. Uh, of course, this is a very, uh, you can say, a densely populated city. Um, and uh, initially, what we thought that we will just divide it into this grid. But then the idea uh, dropped because the grid is not a natural, uh, you can say, um, uh, natural geography of, of the city. So, so then we use these union councils and nine zones to come up with 40 different uh, regions of the city, uh, not based on a square, but based on the, the, you can say, the boundaries for the roads, for the population. And uh, there is a link uh, down here. I will share this presentation and you can go and, and uh, there is a detailed video of how we came up uh, of developing a whole process of developing regions out of the city. It's based on population density, based on the geography of the, of the region, also based on some data about 
uh, the already uh, information about uh, you can say the air quality. Um, we faced some challenges uh, in the implementation. And the challenges was that, uh, I mean, probably we were naive uh, at the time when we, uh, when we started this project that uh, ambient air quality and on-road emissions are two different things. Ambient air quality is where you have the air, uh, you can say away from any kind of a source of, uh, of any kind of pollution. Uh, say you cannot just put it next to an industry or next to a road. It should be somewhere where, where you can say you'd see the, 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 the natural air of the city. And uh, the problem on the road emission is that it is about 30% higher, uh, typically 30% higher, depending on the rush on the road. So if the road is very busy, uh, the number could be 30% higher, but let's say if you go out there at night when there is virtually no traffic, uh, there, there, is, there are not, uh, not, not much difference from the ambient air quality. Another problem we faced that we started uh, working on, um, uh, initially we thought that we will put it on buses, uh, but buses have had two problems. Uh, but the first problem is that they are all fossil fuel. Unfortunately, we do not have electric buses yet in the city, although uh, the government is planning to procure them, but currently we don't have them. So uh, once the, you have installed the sensors on the buses, their own uh, emissions from the buses can actually, can, can, can uh, disturb the value. So, so the value of even the on-road emission is not really uh, calculated uh, uh, measured because of uh, the, the the emission of the bus. The second problem with the uh, with the buses was that uh, the buses run whenever there's passenger volume um, or whenever there is reasonable passenger volume uh, from 5 a.m. to maybe 12, and then those five hours in between there there's no bus that run on that particular route, and then of course there are holidays, there are uh, public holidays, religious holidays, when the buses uh, operate on a reduced uh, frequency. Um, and finally, another problem uh, is that whenever uh, we have come across these uh, low-cost sensors, uh, as I talked about earlier, the sustainability of these low-cost sensors has always been a challenge uh, because uh, some NGO, some donor agency, some industry through this ESR funds can fund those sensors, but long-term calibration, long-term maintenance is, is already a, a challenge. So, so we also thought that this challenge is is uh, is uh, going to create problems once the project lifetime ends. Uh, we were almost ready to install our sensors on whatever we have developed on the public buses, but then we got a surprise from the government and that was back in November last year. And uh, the surprise was that uh, the government, uh, because they were quite uh, annoyed by the bad publicity of, uh, you can say the air quality sensors, privately installed air quality sensors. Uh, and of course the blame is going on the government that they are not doing enough. Uh, and then basically what they said that you cannot share air quality readings. And if you do it, uh, we are going to put a case on you and, and possibly put you in jail. And that was of course uh, something that uh, we cannot take it lightly. Uh, so we, you can say just uh, withhold our idea of installing these uh, sensors on the buses. Uh, but of course there are good people in the government. We, we, we went to them. We, we, explain to them what we are doing. And eventually after a few months, we got some permission. Um, in the meanwhile, while this, uh, all this, uh, the negotiation with the government was going on, what we did was that we at least installed the sensors on uh, uh, stationary locations. So we decided on, based on our own uh, criteria of where the installed sensor should be installed. What are the key locations where the uh, sensor should be installed, where it can safe, safe, secure, can provide us a good glimpse of what the values are uh, that are coming from the city. Um, and then we, of course, uh, uh, I can, I'm not going to go into detail of how we divided the regions, but we had a whole algorithm or, or methodology of dividing the regions for the stationary sensors. Um, so here are some of the, the pictures from the different sensors we installed. We tried to go towards uh, more private uh, locations because uh, we didn't want to, I mean, because we were having trouble with the government already. So we just installed it. One of installed just outside uh, the building where I'm sitting, if you see on the left-hand side, and then another one uh, near a parking lot uh, uh, in the close to where I'm sitting. And then eight of them uh, uh, around the city and, and the locations are all recorded. Uh, 
So with the government came back to us and they said that, okay, you can uh, do install your sensors for R&D purposes and you can share the data, but of course you cannot have uh, the government liable for this data because this is your own data and uh, this the government has uh, um, should not be held accountable for the data that you're collecting. Uh, the requirement that they posed on us is that you should go through the go through a co-location activity. And the co-location activity is that uh, there is a mobile van uh, which has the EPA grade sensors. So they said that whenever uh, you want to install your sensors, you have to co-locate them uh, with the, the, the EPA certified sensors on the van. And uh, once the co-location activity is complete and we are satisfied with the, the, the quality of the data that it's not uh, too much uh, uh, different from what uh, the, uh, the, the, the the EPA certified sensors are going, the, the you can say the error margin is less, then we'll allow you to have uh, this. And, and meanwhile, other entities like World Bank also joined because they also were installing uh, some sensors. So, so we did a whole activity um, uh, earlier this year. And uh, if you see on the left-hand side, all these sensors are on top of this van that you see on the right-hand side. And this is me and my team lead, Josefa, standing uh, next to the van. So, so we did this co-location activity for about a week, and then the sensors were ready to be installed. Meanwhile, what happened was that Asia Connect uh, gave us a second round of uh, a grant money. And uh, they said that, okay, whatever you think that you have not been able to achieve in the first grant, what challenges you face, uh, you can now uh, fix those challenges and uh, uh, see that how we can solve those sensors and solve those, all the challenges that you have in the first place. Now, um, in this one, we did something different. And, and the something different was that rather than using buses, uh, we have another project going on at our university of electric three wheelers. So we thought that, okay, uh, buses, by the way, had another problem that uh, the since the sensor is very high on the bus, uh, the almost about eight feet or something, uh, the typical, you can say the placement of the sensor is of human height, which is about six feet or something. Um, so with three wheelers, we actually got to that height of uh, six feet and, and, and installed our sensor. And since there are electric vehicles, uh, there is no, uh, you can say the, the, the value is going to be measured off around in the, uh, whatever the atmosphere is or whether it's on road and, or ambient. Now, uh, this is one of the vehicle where uh, we, we uh, started installing our sensors. Now we are uh, in the, you can say, process of procurement, procuring this vehicle. We have one vehicle ready that is now undergoing testing of where the sensor should be installed because we have a battery and we have a, a solar panel and then the sensors have to be installed in the right place so that uh, it can get the, the sufficient air to, to monitor air quality. Uh, then we did another thing and that's very interesting. Uh, we said that rather than having um, random routes of buses, now this is these three wheelers are kind of at our control at least for the duration of the project, and then we can develop uh, a sustainable model of our own. What we did was that in the left, on the left side, you see the bus routes that we were planning. So, so buses come around and then they follow a certain route and then they go from one part of the city to the other, and then they come back and the, I mean, they just follow all that route. All that route is typically on major highways or, or major roads, which, which are typically have more passenger traffic and more uh, vehicles. Uh, as a result, it has a lot of uh, on-road emissions. So we thought that rather than using the buses, why don't we provide the last mile connectivity through these vehicles, through these three wheelers? So if you see, this is the same map from the same vicinity. Uh, on the left-hand side are the two bus routes that may crisscross each other. On the right-hand side are the last mile connectivity from different bus stops. So, so the bus stop uh, the passenger drop uh, passenger got off from, from buses and then they go into an, our three-wheeler and the three-wheeler follow a certain fixed route, but there are two advantages to that fixed route. One is that it is going through neighborhoods that typically have less uh, on-road emissions because of less traffic density. In fact, some of them have very so low density that you can be very, very close to ambient air quality. And then we donated these stops, which are the purple, uh, you can say dots uh, on the left hand on the right hand side, where the vehicle stops for a few seconds, and the sensors automatically, but since they are re uh, reading this for every 15 seconds or something, and then they get the reading for a stationary location. 
So, so with a three-wheeler, what we were able to do is that, that we are getting uh, the values of the neighborhood from roads which have less uh, traffic, as well as we are stopping at certain location and kind of using our vehicle as a stationary sensor. And then of course, these vehicles do a, a run uh, at least one time uh, in an hour throughout the 24 hours, even if the buses are operating or not, since they are in our control, we can, we can have them uh, go around. Um, so this provided, so, so these, uh, having these uh, vehicles under our control actually gave us a lot more, uh, you can say, uh, control over the project, as well as a lot more control over how do we measure uh, the ambient air quality. Uh, another thing we did in our platform is that we tried to mate our platform, and this is an effort that is even going on as we speak, is to have different sources of data from the city, from the uh, private providers, from the government, from some of the consulates and embassies that have installed their sensors uh, on a voluntary basis, and try to collect all the data and present it as a, as, as a one-stop shop for all the emission data available uh, for the city. And, and that uh, then somebody can, can say that, okay, filter out the data from this source or that source, or uh, I want to see the data from EP certified sensor only, or I want to see the data for, 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 for this region, whatever number of sensors are available. So you can have a lot of data sources that are available. We have developed open APIs. So anybody would like to share uh, their data with us, the API is available, and uh, we just need to uh, get the data and put it on, on our website. Finally, I think this is the, my favorite part of the project is how do we make it sustainable? So the project funding is at most one year, maybe a few months more, maybe we get another grant from somebody else or from, uh, from the same funding agency, we don't know. But the problem is that as soon as this project finishes, typically uh, most of the sensors, most of the vehicle just, just becomes uh, redundant. Nobody really cares about that. So we wanted to develop a model where it has a sustainability model packed to the sensor because sensors are not there for business. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a startup where you can get money from other people, sell your products, sell your services, and then uh, get money. Nobody's interested in uh, air quality uh, numbers, at least for now, for, for, for generating a business. So we thought that, okay, what can we do? These three wheelers, uh, if I just go back, these are passenger vehicles, and we have two or three different models of them. There is uh, one which is a three passenger one, one that is a six passenger one. Now, these are, uh, as I told you earlier, that this is providing the last mile connectivity. So this is generating a business. So when this is generating a business, uh, and so these are three wheelers, electric three wheelers, their running cost is almost one third or less of a typical fuel-based equivalent. What this gives us is that we have the two third money uh, or, or more that can pay for the salary of the driver uh, of the vehicle. And a part of that can be spared for the maintenance of the whole platform. For, for the sensors, for any kind of, uh, you can say maintenance that we do, any kind of calibration, because we need to do calibration of, calibration of these sensors every year. And that calibration money needs to come from somewhere. So what we did with this, or, or we are trying to do, uh, so our, our first vehicle is out and other vehicles will be on road by end of September, uh, that about 25% of whatever they are going to earn will be used for the maintenance and uh, the upkeep of the sensors and the sensing devices, whether it's battery, because the battery has a degradation issue, you have to replace the battery after every few months, um, and then uh, calibration of the sensors. These are the two major expenses that 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 are going uh, that we are going to incur, and this 25% of the amount is is enough according to our calculation to make sure that the platform is running, the platform is op operating even after the duration of the project uh, finishes. Uh, we hope to have this as a model for other cities as well. Of course, now we have to collect the data, talk with the climate uh, air quality experts and see that the weather data is usable. Uh, fortunately, other, other entities like World Bank have partnered with us. Uh, there are other uh, agencies that are also in negotiation with us. So I think this project is gaining uh, traction and the kind of, you can say the approach that we are, uh, that, 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 that we are employing here is also getting traction. So hopefully uh, we are working on this. And uh, I think in, at APAN 55, we should be able to give you some real solid numbers of uh, what uh, we have learned. And uh, so until then, I think, uh, thank you very much for listening and I'll be open to 
uh, comments, questions, feedback, uh, I'll be happy to uh, listen to uh, the feedback from uh, colleagues around. Wow, that was um, really interesting, uh, Naveed. And uh, yes, it's, it's different and than your, your previous talk. It's an improvement. Um, and I still have some questions. <laughs> so um, I, I haven't seen any uh, Q&A questions uh, turn up just yet, but I'll ask my questions now to give the audience uh, some time uh, for them to, uh, you know, to think, to, to digest uh, the, the information. And so um, I think I had this problem before, the, the last mile connectivity is actually not, it's not a connectivity, it's actually making um, uh, the final journey, isn't it, from the, from the bus stop to the person's home. So that, that confused me a little bit. But talking about connectivity, how did you actually get... Uh, uh, the data out of these sensors do they do they talk wi-fi when they're near a hotspot or do they have a, a cellular uh, uplink right so uh, initially we thought of uh, putting up our own devices for getting the data from uh, the sensor but they realized that there is actually a regulation in pakistan that you can only get data from a certified uh, mobile service provider while you are away and the wi-fi is uh, is is tricky because uh, they are not public hotspots available so, so at best, you, when you when you go around and come back, you can actually download the data. Uh, what I think our vendor has done for us is that they have actually installed a SIM from a local vendor. So the so the system already has a 4G connectivity, uh, and since the 4G network also may create problems or the or, or the vehicle is out of uh, the network, uh, you can say area of coverage. Uh, the, there is a local uh, storage of data. So whenever there's connectivity, the, the data will be available back to us. And uh, so, so at this time, we are using a, a SIM inside the box, uh, which is connected through 4G, that is sending the data to our network. And so um, I've got a question that's come in from uh, Mohammed uh, Tarit from um, BD Ren. So I'll, I'll modify his question ever so slightly. He's asking, and since these hotspots or since the air quality monitors are moving, he wanted to know if there's much variation from the data collected from different sources. But what I'm going to say is, do different three-wheelers have different um, values when they get back to the same spot as others? That, that is, that is a, a very well uh, a possibility because uh, maybe on one side of the road, uh, a vehicle is maybe is uh, having less of uh, smoke, I would say, and on the side, there is there's more smoke. Uh, those data will start coming up when the, the project will actually will have, uh, we have about 12 vehicles that we will put up on board by end of September. Um, I think those are the numbers that we are expecting to be different, but we need to have a way to how to maybe average it out or how to maybe um, make a meaningful number out of those values. Uh, we have some uh, air quality experts uh, with us uh, now since the World Bank has, uh, has partnered with us. So, so they are they have a really good experts on their team. And together, I think we'll try to find a method where those numbers, uh, we can minimize the variance between different numbers. Uh, also, we also want to maybe, because of the privacy issues, we do not want to put the location of the vehicle right there where the location is. So, so it will be an area where you can find out, okay, what the, the value is. Uh, whether we average it out or we take the lowest one or the highest one or maybe some other algorithm, uh, that will really depend on what kind of uh, values we are going to get once we install these vehicles on road. Uh, another important point is that we would like to get some data before the smog season, which is in October. And when the smog season uh, kicks in, let's say in November, we would like to get another set of data. So, so the, then we can compare both of them and see that what kind of variance we have uh, under different uh, circumstances or uh, under different uh, uh, air, air quality you can say seasons, I would say. Yeah. You, you also mentioned early on that you originally needed some 700 monitors to uh, to cover the area. Um, and then you've got a certain number on, on these mobile, um, uh, you know, three wheelers. 
So have you done a calculation of how many sort of effective or virtual yeah. monitoring points you've got because they because they actually do move around? So how many, you know, you said you wanted 700 and, and couldn't afford that. How many do you actually have now? And how many are they effectively because they, right. they so, get so to So that's move. a very interesting question. And uh, I think we grappled with this question of how much air quality monitoring solution do we need in a particular city? So initially we thought that maybe US EPA method of, uh, of determining how many air quality monitoring stations it required is a good method. And somebody said that, okay, no, you should go for the Indian method or, or the European method. But then when we talked to the air quality expert, they said that uh, every country has a different situation in terms of air quality. You cannot take the EPA method and apply it directly to Pakistan. Uh, with this project, I think what, also, we are going to get is some kind of information of how is what's the variance in the uh, air quality monitoring amongst different parts of the city, and that will determine that how many monitoring, uh, ideally mo ideal number of monitoring stations are we going to get. Since this is a small project, or you can say just a pilot, we'll have twelve vehicles, maybe eight of them or nine of them will be on road at, at a given time. We are just selected an area of uh, the city that's, uh, I would say about. 20, 25 square kilometer. And uh, there we will be running our vehicles. Um, so, so this is a, you can say this is a more affluent neighborhood uh, and this is not covering, uh, this is not, this is kind of a private area. Um, and uh, this uh, probably will give us more control and also an idea of if we want to expand to the whole city, whether we need 700 virtual points or we need even more or less, that, that probably number will come once we start getting the data and, and, and find out about the variance. And you you made a, a call for accepting uh, data feeds from other people. Are they other data feeds in Lahore? Are they other data feeds in Pakistan, or or are they extended right. to the to so the region? Starting with Lahore, uh, and then of course uh, when the platform will expand, because once uh, it it is uh, it is uh, good for Lahore, it is good for any other city. Um, I would even uh, suggest uh, all the people in the APAN network that once this project finishes, I mean, our, our project is going to be open source. We, we are not going to be having any kind of uh, IP rights over it. If, if you want to take it to anywhere, just take it and replicate it. We'll, be, we'll, we'll try to help as much as we can. In my, my home state of Tasmania has a, a statewide uh, LoRaWAN network that uh, was built, built by a commercial entity um, uh, funded by the state government and people can do sort of individual infill services. So it's both used for R and E purposes as well as uh, commercial purposes. And so they're, they've developed a sustainability model for making that so that the different uh, telemetry sensors um, can, can work in that regard. And I know that in the Netherlands, SurfNet has built an academic LoRaWAN network while the phone company KPN has their commercial LoRaWAN network uh, separate for, for or different purposes. So, um, are you? Would you? Are you working with anyone to move away from those SIM cards to uh, LoRaWAN as a, as a technology um, for updates? Yeah, as we speak, uh, not exactly because our focus is on having the platform up and running, getting the real data. I think following that, we'll be looking at uh, uh, what are the other sustainable options of uh, maybe getting the data. Uh, we probably we need to partner with some, um, you can say some some service provider. Um, that I think we'll do once we have the platform up and running. I think there will be many service provider who'd like to help us out. We have not talked to them uh, yet. Um, and again, another thing is that there are some pretty strict regulations from uh, the Pakistan Delhi Communication Authority about how to use these uh, different bands. So I think those uh, we need to be careful of. Um, so yeah, I think this will be a logical next step once we have the data coming. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, apparently, in my home state, it's a, it's a it's a government requirement to do a a state of the environment report. I think it's supposed to come out every five years, but it hasn't come out for the past thirteen years. So sometimes, <laughs> even in places that uh, espouse being green. Um, we produce 100% of our electricity through hydroelectricity, but uh, um, still our government doesn't want to release an environmental report that may shed some negative light into some areas of our uh, forestry or fishery practices. So it's interesting. I think um, just in concluding, I think that you know, NREN's 
provide a public good. People, um, you know, there's certain things that NRNs have to do for the security or the quality of the network that they can't directly monetize. And I mm -hmm. think that your project is incredibly innovative, not, not just not in collecting air quality data, but actually trying to find a, a business model that will work with electric uh, three wheelers uh, I, and I hope that, you know, maybe the government can do something on the road tax or registration requirements to further lower that for vehicles that, you know, have these sensors fitted so that you don't just have, uh, yeah, so, so there's an incentive for, for the, these drivers of these three wheelers to want to have air quality yeah. sensors. So uh, I think on, on that front, I think government has done some, some remarkable steps. They have actually reduced the registration cost of any kind of electric vehicle to, I mean, just 5% of the normal amount. So that's virtually free. And then the road tax is also 75% less. So, so I think that's, that's a good, uh, uh, you can say, incentive for the people to own the electric vehicles. So I think that's already there. We just need to now have some sensors and make a sustainable model out of it. Um, well, Dr. Naveed uh, Ashad, I'm really sorry that you cannot hear an applause from the audience, right? Um, it was a great talk and, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, interest from the wider community. Um, everyone can try and find you on, on Hoover or get in touch with uh, APAN Secretariat or myself, and uh, we can put you in touch. But we will be looking forward to, uh, I think you said you were going to provide an update at uh, APAN 55 in Nepal. Certainly, certainly. I'd, I'd love to provide an update because with the, with, the, with more visuals and the more data, uh, and I'll be, uh, I mean, my team will be happy to collaborate with uh, other uh, colleagues uh, in the NREN and, and any anywhere. Um, uh, on the, these kind of projects, and we will be very open to collaboration. My my contact details are here. You can contact me through any any medium you prefer. That's uh, that's great. There's also an Internet of Things uh, um, uh, working group within APAN. I'm not too sure if they're. Uh, I I was unable to attend their session, so I don't know if they're dealing with just the technology or the practical applications of of using sensors. Um, but yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see an update within that, within that fora or, uh, or, or, or on the big stage um, when we uh, finally get to meet in, in Nepal. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very um, much. Our, our next speaker, um, Dr. Tomohiko uh, Moriyama, uh, his talk on telemedicine before, during and beyond the pandemic. Um, I think, uh, well, everyone here has uh, survived the pandemic. Right? But that's not uh, the case for all members of the APAN community or the extended family. They haven't necessarily been as, uh, as fortunate. And so um, um, Dr. Uh, Moriyama, he's an expert in gastro, gastrointestinal endoscopy um, as part of TEMDEC. So hopefully people know TEMDEC from the uh, telemedicine uh, group. Um, for 20 years, he's been uh, a diagnostician for the treatment of uh, gastrointestinal uh, cancer um, and has taught uh, gastroenterology and endoscopic techniques to 100 Japanese medical residents and uh, 200 uh, foreign trainees. And so, um, uh, Dr. Moriyama, the, uh, the screen is yours. I look forward to uh, your presentation. Okay. okay, thank you for your introduction, Brooke. And I really appreciate all the uh, APAN secretariat and the Brooks to giving me a, uh, to give me a such kind of big opportunity to talk about our activity in telemedicine. So, okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Tomoshiko Moriyama from Kyushu University Hospital. I myself, is, as I mentioned, from uh, Brook, uh, gastro GI endoscopist, and also a chair of APA Medical Working Group. So today, I'd like to talk about uh, medicine activities uh, of Temedec, and also uh, I'd like to talk about a bit about what happened in the telemedicine field, uh, mainly in doctor to doctor education. Okay, now we're, uh, we have been suffering for the pandemic uh, more than, for more than two years. 
But in general, uh, the measures against NCD is a big issue in the world. Uh, as you see in this uh, figure, uh, it, uh, disability adjusted life years of uh, NCD is uh, increasing uh, year by year. And this uh, non-communicable disease, NCD, kills about you know, 41 million people each year which is equivalent to 31% of all deaths. So it is very important how to tackle with uh, non-communicable diseases in the city. But the measure against the city is quite diverse in the world. And this is a heat map of NCD related mortality under the age of 70. As you see, in the developed countries, the mortality of in these premature ages is very low, but comparing, uh, but in the developing country, uh, this mortality ratio is quite high. So it's a very big issue and there should be a medical disparities in this area. Actually, the leading cause of NCD-related deaths is CVD, cerebral vascular disease and cardiovascular diseases, followed by cancer, respiratory diseases, and diabetes. So to save the patient uh, from those diseases, uh, prevention and early diagnosis is very important. Uh, about CVD diseases, prevention is quite important because sometimes uh, so there is subsequent complications such as paralysis or exercise limitation uh, in CVD diseases. So prevention uh, is quite important. So it is very important to control the diabetes, hypertension, this epidemia. These are the major causes of arteriosclerosis, which leads to CBD. And also prevention from smoke, uh, avoid from smoking is also very important. But in the cancer, this is a kind of age-related diseases. So it's very difficult to prevent so early diagnosis is a uh, very important using blood analysis and image uh, diagnosis such as endoscopy, CT, ultrasonography, and things like that. This figure shows the age-adjusted cancer incidence and mortality. As you know, Japan is one of the aging society super aging society. That's why the incidence of cancer is uh, higher than that of the world. But comparing, uh, so uh, I'd like to show, but the situation is a bit different from other countries. I'd like to show one example, gastric cancer. The incidence is quite high in Japan, but its mortality is uh, less than one third of its incidence. Comparing to its incidence, mortality is very low. Uh, but in other countries, incidence and mortality is almost the same, which means once the gastric cancer is diagnosed, most of them died of gastric cancer. Actually, in those countries, uh, the gastric cancer uh, is detected in advanced stage. So surgical operation is needed of course, uh, they should admit, admit and also there is uh, some risk of recurrence and also death. But in our country, most of gastric cancer is diagnosed at a very early stage and will be rejected endoscopically. Of course, the patient will recover very soon and they can go back to work just after the discharge from hospital. So early diagnosis is very, very important to save their lives and also save their quality of life. So of course, there are so many uh, key factors uh, to get this kind of very, very good uh, results in this field, uh, such as cheap health checkup system, uh, free access to healthcare providers, and something like that. 
But most important thing is education. Uh, actually, there are so many medical associations in Japan and uh, they established a very well organized education system. So, and through this education system, we can share our knowledge and experience uh, among doctors. So we can uh, achieve early diagnosis and minimal invasive therapy. That's why many uh, uh, foreign doctors uh, visit us to learn what we do. And also we share our knowledge and experiences through on-site training. And we sometimes go abroad to do uh, some medical procedure and also do uh, some live demo or something like that. This, as you know, of course, this kind of on-site training is quite effective, but uh, it's very short term and also intermittent usually. And we should pay travel expenses and also accommodation fee is needed. And uh, the only limited number of doc doctors can share the knowledge through on-site training. That's why we started telemedicine activities connecting many institutions like that. But for medical education, high quality images are essential. In these six photos in the stomach, there is a gastric cancer. Can you detect it? These are the early gastric cancer and almost of them, uh, all of this lesion were rejected endoscopically. Uh, we, if we can't detect uh, such kind of subtle changes in the stomach, we can't uh, save the patient life. So to educate the doctors, it is very important to use uh, this kind of high quality of images. So we decided to use this advanced research and education network. We have a good association, APAM. So under this APAM, as a form, uh, former uh, chair of the working group, Dr. Shimizu uh, developed uh, uh, this group uh, in 2005. So using this broad and stable uh, network, uh, we can connect uh, country, many countries using our own PC, uh, using free apps and the video camera like this. It's quite cheap and user-friendly devices. We have organized various kinds of telemedicine. One uh, most major one is a webinar. I suppose and most of them are quite familiar with this webinar. And in medical field, case discussion is also very important to share the experience of uh, interesting or uh, rare cases. And uh, especially in the surg surgery and the endoscopy, uh, learning the technique from experts through live demo is very important. And, uh, and also uh, many doctors enjoy uh, this demonstration. This is a conventional uh, live demonstration. Uh, there are many, many international faculty go, uh, go abroad to show their to show the amazing technique. And they, once they will uh, get together uh, at the hospital, very close to the main venue, and their technique will be broadcasted to the, main, uh, the participants like this. But for these doctors, they should do their uh, medical procedure in totally different atmosphere. Of course, endoscopic room and operation theater is different and they should use a different equipment and the team member is not so familiar with them. And sometimes the indication for the treatment is totally different from ours and they cannot take care of the patient uh, after they go back, after they go back to their own country. And sometimes we feel the, uh, some language barriers and jet lag is a big issue for uh, the demonstrator. And uh, for the uh, organizers, they should prepare lots of patients. It's a, sometimes a very trouble. So uh, we connect uh, 
Asian institutes uh, using the uh, RAN, Red Research and Education Network. This lab endoscopy was performed at APAN 24. At that time, endoscopic procedure was shown from Kyoto, Japan, and Fukuoka, and broadcasted to the China, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and Germany. To do such kind of uh, big uh, event, uh, there should be a uh, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, through this kind of big event, we have accelerated uh, telemedicine activities. And th these are the keys for the success of telemedicine. One is needs from doctors. Without any needs, uh, we uh, no telemedicine. Uh, second is the internet as access. Uh, we can use a research and education network for the live demo and also for other kind of webinar, the case discussion. And other important thing is skills by engineers. So uh, the, uh, the so uh, co-working with the engineers and the medical staff is uh, essential to uh, make telemedicine successful. So we have trained many engineers using APA network. This is a medical working programs in this APAN 54 meeting. Like this, uh, we organize a 12 uh, meeting uh, in uh, this APAN. So, uh, and like, like that, uh, we have organized many uh, programs in under the uh, APAN medical working group. And we have invited uh, many foreign engineers and also they joined to the APAM and through this uh, on the job training at APAM, they can do a uh, hands-on training at, medical, at many medical sessions like this. This is at uh, Singapore uh, in 2018, New Zealand in, uh, same, uh, in 2018, and Korea in 2019, like this. And also we have invited many engineers to our center, Kyushu University Hospital, and we uh, lectures was given to them and also hands-on training was performed uh, like this. And uh, our engineer uh, taught them how to connect the medical devices to the internet at the operation room and, uh, and endoscopic room. We have fosters leaders uh, in engineer, engineering field in each country. And also we have organized domestic workshops like this. Uh, actually, uh, we, there is a very limited uh, opportunity to meet the doctor and the engineers. So uh, we have organized a domestic workshop to have the output uh, and doctors and the engineers get together and discuss how to accelerate telemedicine in their own countries. We have uh, conducted this workshop in Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Nepal, Myanmar, Kyrgyzstan, Bhutan, Mexico, and Chile. So uh, through this kind of repetitive uh, workshops and education, uh, accumulated numbers of uh, telemedicine programs is steadily increasing. And now the special number of the special interest group is expanded to 40. And these are the contents of our telemedicine program. Like this, uh, the very, we have the various kinds of program. The leading one is endoscopy, followed by surgery, pediatrics, oncology, technology, healthcare, or something, and uh, something like that. It's, and in, as you know, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has started uh, in, uh, in early uh, 2020. 
this is a quite new diseases and no one know what happened and uh, in southeastern asian countries and no one knows what the virus uh, act and how to prevent uh, people from the infection at that time we remember the past experience at apan 23 at that time bird flu was a very uh, serious issue, especially in Asian countries. Uh, in about this disease, Indonesia has a lot of experience. So uh, we organized this conference and share their knowledge and experiences among the uh, among participants. So based on this experience, we. Uh, conducted international teleconference on COVID-19 uh, at early uh, 2020, just the beginning of the pandemic, uh, connecting Asian countries and Central Asian countries like this. We have organized this teleconference uh, three times and actually more than 4,000 attendees. Uh, enjoyed and uh, our discussion and uh, through our uh, the presentation, uh, they I suppose uh, they uh, know and learn how to prevent their stuff from COVID and also how to uh, prevent uh, the people from these diseases. And through this pandemic, teleconference systems are dramatically improved. Previously, we used a little bit complicated system and a bit expensive system. But uh, through the, uh, of course, we have an, uh, this kind of easier, cheaper, and convenient system for teleconferences, but its quality is not so good at that time. But through the pandemic, the quality of these uh, teleconference system is dramatically improved. And uh, due to the uh, moving restrictions and to share the knowledge and for the medical, for medical education for doctors and students, many countries started telemedicine. Uh, in 2020, we, uh, Conduct, uh, we organized the teleconference uh, with Bhutan, Myanmar, and uh, Central Asia and uh, Caucasian countries like that. And even in Japan, uh, we can see a dramatic, dramatically increasing of web meetings. In our hospital, uh, many departments started telemedicine. Like this internal medicine, surgery, pediatric, also ophthalmology, uh, biochemistry, or some, and things like that. It's a kind of general expansion using a very uh, convenient uh, system. And we have supported uh, many virtual meetings of medical associations in Japan. Uh, in 2020, uh, June. Uh, this is a first uh, first time the support for the medical associate uh, association of Japan, uh, and successfully uh, we success to uh, support this teleconference uh, teleconference, uh, and attendees were dramatically increased comparing to the last year's congress, and also and. After that, we have supported many uh, congresses like that. And the participation styles was changed like this. Before the pandemic, many institutes joined our teleconference by groups like this. But after the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the Attendees joined personally using their own PC, smartphone, or tablet. So, of course, the, we can control, we should control the many attendees, but uh, it's not so difficult. And 
uh, now they are quite familiar with this kind of uh, tele uh, teleconferencing system. So the less technical support is needed. And the setting of live endoscopy become very easier. Before the pandemic, we should prepare many engineers and complicated system like this. But by the dramatically improvement of the teleconferencing system, now we can uh, broadband, uh, broadcast the uh, endoscopy using one PC with one doctor or engineer who are familiar with ICT systems. And the lower uh, right lower photo shows the endoscopy live demo from Japan to Russia and Europe. Uh, through uh, this uh, improvement, we can do a, a provide a technical support remotely. Now the telemedicine is for everybody. Remember more than 20 years ago, we can only connect a big hospital using the big internet like REM. Uh, but now uh, the commercial network is improved and uh, we can connect to these small hospital and also uh, medical uh, medical personnel. It's and also using the user friendly teleconference system. Of course, the through these changes, uh, the uh, attendees and the number of attendees is dramatically increased like this. So, to do a uh, uh, teleconferencing, uh, international teleconference, uh, frequently, we should do uh, uh, lots of coordination tasks like this, fixing the date and times and the registration announcement, making a flyer, or the, uh, let them know the link address or something like that. It's very complicated. So <clears throat> now the support of coordinator is very important the co-working with, uh, with engineers, coordinators, and medical staff is now the key for good telemedicine. Of course, uh, through this uh, pandemic, many doctors are aware of the usefulness of telemedicine. This is a live endoscopy from novice to experts. The experts in US uh, makes many advices uh, while watching the procedure from uh, uh, Nigeria. And this kind of trial is already started in Japan. Uh, this is a, uh, one example, uh, connecting Kyushu University Hospital uh, and Sapporo, the very northern part of the Japan islands. And so uh, using the internet, uh, the expert in Sapporo uh, make uh, using annotation like this. And other trial is already started in various countries. This is a report uh, uh, from, I'm not sure where, I'm sorry, forget to where <laughs> the country is, but anyway, this is a tele-robotic ultrasound. <clears throat> this ultrasound uh, device is controlled remotely and the show that uh, images was shown on his PC like this. We can see the uh, gold bladder stone like this, and also we can see the small infant in the dream like this. So we can make a diagnosis uh, in, uh, using these devices. And now in China, robot assisted laparoscopic care surgery has just started. Uh, the connecting uh, the, uh, this uh, surgeon and the remote area, he do a uh, remote surgery using this robotic system. This is a kind of, it's really amazing, and but it's a real. So this kind of advanced uh, medication is uh, it's now just started. And also education is changing <laughs> using the metaverse or and uh, extended reality like this. 
at the APA 47, the uh, people uh, demonstrated this kind of uh, metaverse system uh, to learn the anatomy. And also at ATS 2019, uh, this guy is very famous for XR uh, in medical field, uh, showed a presentation about the uh, pre-operative uh, plan using the XR. And also metaverse is a kind of a very um, challenging uh, for the medical education. The young doctor can uh, do uh, uh, train their own skill without harming patient and the animals on the metaverse platform. So it is very quite, um, uh, I suppose it's a very good uh, field to do uh, this kind of uh, training. And also many international online consultation is, is now doing uh, from, uh, this is a, a consultation from patient like second opinion. And also we have a many uh, consultation from uh, foreign doctors. And we use uh, the patient info, private information to do this kind of online consultation. So we, uh, the stable and secure network are very important and essential to protect their privacy. So, uh, in this kind of advanced uh, telemedicine, uh, we need a support from skillful engineers and also stable and broadband network is essential. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a summary of my presentation. Telemedicine is becoming more popular and casual in the COVID-19 era. And as I mentioned, coordination skills are very important to make telemedicine more casual. And also, advanced engineer skills and stable broadband network are essential for the future telemedicine. Finally, I would like to say thank you for your great and persistent support for our telemedicine activities. Thank you for your attention. I thank you uh, very much, um, Dr. Moriyama. Um, we do, in fact, have some uh, some questions from the audience, and uh, and so I'll make you know, cancer scares everyone. And at least by the time you've reached my age, you've had uh, family, friends, or colleagues that have been uh, touched by it or even uh, taken by it. Um, and so, a question from uh, Patch Lee. You had a, a, a picture that had six pictures um, determining uh, cancer in one of your slides. Um, has there been much growth in the use of, of AI to be able to, you know, better help identify that uh, and assist experts that have to look at, you know, I think looking at slides, I think there was a big um, scandal uh, in, uh, I think, in uh, Ireland, where Ireland had outsourced the um, the checking of pap smears that went to a, an organisation in the US that did a very poor job of assessing them. Um, and they didn't have, you know, uh, other AI techniques to assist people in having to look at, at, at lots of uh, slides. So, you know, has that, has that changed? And is that work that appears within the... Uh, uh, within Temdec? Okay, uh, actually the Temdec is uh, just an uh, education sector. So the, uh, not uh, we are not trying to do, uh, develop this kind, such kind of uh, equipment or devices so far. But then, uh, I myself is an endoscopist, so I have a bit of uh, knowledge about on this field. The, as you may know, the AI is now the installing to the medical field, uh, especially in the image diagnosis. The endoscopy is a good field for AI, actually. In CT and the MRI and, the, uh, and also ultrasound, we can review the images after the exam. But the, in endoscopy, we should make a diagnosis during the procedure. It's a totally different. So that's why AI is quite useful and already launched in colon, colonoscopy already and it will be launched this year in about an gastric cancer. I'm not sure uh, the, how it 
exercise, uh, how uh, the, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, they can definitely detect the early cancer or not. But anyway, uh, already uh, some papers article uh, art, and the articles mentioned that the, it's uh, uh, sensitivity, sensitivity is quite high. Of course, in the, the almost the same with the GI expert. So that's why I think the AI should be very uh, quite useful. But same as uh, AI driver, AI dri driving, uh, driving, uh, someone should be responsible for the results. So only the doctor can do it. That's why then, uh, I think that, that this kind of education is quite important. Okay, and so uh, a question that uh, Muhammad uh, Tarita had from BD Ren: a lot of the telemedicine tools that you're talking about now just use the commodity internet. You know, you've gone from specific video conferencing services, you know, provided by Wide to now general purpose uh, tools like Zoom. So, um, how does the RNE? Uh, networks still differentiate in the in the areas of telemedicine and and how how are they changing to remain relevant? Okay, thank you for a good question. Uh, actually, uh, before the pandemic, uh, only REM uh, is a good infrastructure to do a telemedicine. But then at that time, the commercial network is so narrow and the quality is not so good actually. And also, the teleconference system needs a very broadband. So that's why the, the, it is very, sometimes very difficult to make some teleconference before the pandemic. But as I, as I mentioned, the system is dramatically improved and, and also the commercial network is also improved. That's why we can do a, this kind of a conference and a discussion using Zoom or, or WebEx or something like that, Teams or something like that. We can do, do it now. But, for advanced telemedicine, such as live demo or other future telemedicine, as I introduced, uh, I suppose that uh, we should we need a broad and stable network. That should be a REM, I think. Um, and I have some questions of my own. Uh, so I, I wasn't aware that uh, engineers also attended some of your events. And so, you know, historically, H323 video conferencing, which actually isn't very secure, and then um, very evident at the early start of the pandemic was this phenomenon of Zoom bombing, where people would turn up and play disruptive music or disruptive videos in, in Zoom uh, events, which caused Zoom to look at security. What is the sort of next biggest technology change that needs to happen that the that the you know it engineers and the research networks can help in, in improving uh, telemedicine okay thank you uh, it's very also an important question uh as i mentioned I, telemedicine have a very good future uh because a network is improving now moving to 5g and the 6g 7g i'm not sure but anyway the the uh, internet is more stable and becoming more broad or something like that. So that we can do uh, uh, some kind of a medical procedure or remote patient care on the XR or metaverse or something like that. About uh, regarding metaverse, we are not satisfied actually. Uh, we can do nothing about medical procedure on the metaverse so far, I think. But uh, I'm not sure what happened in the next five years. So. Uh, at that time, of course, you know, we would like to co work with engineers and also we sh should uh, uh, also share the knowledge uh, and also new technology about this field. So, uh, also, uh, the support from the skilled and uh, engineer is essential for us. Yeah, I, I've had I've had the um, pleasure of going to see some of uh, Gunther von Hagen's uh, exhibitions, and this is the uh, this is the anatomist that developed plastination that dissolves the human body, and uh, and you have a, a version of the uh, the vascular system, for instance, or, or, or very good representations of muscles. So that's like a a pre metaverse version of that, and he did a uh, um, a TV series 
called All New Anatomy, uh, All New Autopsy Live, right? Where he did live autopsies in the UK because body donation was so low. Um, historically, uh, body donation became an industry and, and famously uh, William Burke and William Hare would then, they were making money um, delivering dead uh, you know cadavers to the uh, union of edinburgh and then they started to actually actively kill people so that they would have bodies and so you know students don't actually have much access so you know as as a as a patient rather than a doctor i'd like to know that the medical students get to work on a, a cadaver at some point before um uh you know having to deal with me but how can the improvement uh, of, uh, of understanding medical procedures and, and practicing medical procedures in, in the metaverse uh, improve you know, patient outcomes? Okay, thank you. Right, uh, the, okay, before, uh, the, right, okay. Now we are in this pandemic situation. So the access to the operation theater for medical students is sometimes limited to prevent, uh, to save the, uh, the patient from infection. So, but if we have you know, some kind of 3D system or metaverse system to show the operation technique or other, and, and also we, if we can do some medical education on that platform, we can uh, educate them without the risk of infection. And also the, sometimes it's very difficult to close to the surgical field for the medical students, don't don't don't, don't be so, so close. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the surgeon says so. When I was a student, I said I was said to that. But anyway, uh, if there is some camera inside the body or something like that, and uh, they can uh, watch what way what is uh, performed in the uh, body or inside of the body or something like that. And that should be the quite an effective education for students and also for doctors, novice doctors. So uh, this kind of, uh, such kind of uh, this metaverse or XR, and also XR is quite important to do and some plan, to make some plan before the surgery or something. So that should be the very challenging. And also uh, it's a, I, I think it's kind of promising. Yeah, I um, I just watched an old TV series that I liked once. It was uh, filmed in the 1980s, and it wasn't. It was filmed on videotape and not on uh, on film. And so these days, it looks incredibly awful on my big screen TV. And I just noticed that uh, you know this Zoom session, it says that I'm receiving the video as a you know a three uh, three twenty by one eighty uh, pixels. You know that's not good enough for, for doctors or experts to assess medical images. So I think that really high uh, bandwidth networks are still going to be needed and uncompressed video. You don't, you've got this strange compression artifacts around me. You don't want compression artifacts that might mask a real uh, a, a problem, the, the sign, uh, the, the early sign of cancer or, hide uh colors in a you know that might be uh, prevalent in uh in uh in high resolution scanning so i still think that uh rna networks will still be needed for you know for, for the bandwidth that we provide because i don't think um zoom is great for for learning about your experiences but maybe not great for for all instances of, of telemedicine I, uh, I thank you for your time today and I thank the audience for uh, being patient with me and, and, uh, and staying for, for the entire broadcast. Um, you can uh, continue to collaborate with everyone by the, uh, the Hoover platform and, uh, and ask questions there. Um, people from, uh, from Temdec, uh, as well as various chat groups uh, within, within Hoover exist. So you can reach out to people. Um, I, uh, also the exhibition space uh, thanking the the sponsors that have uh, helped make this event possible uh, as well as the members of the program committee that have put uh, together uh, an excellent program that i hope you're all enjoying um, 
you've got a little bit of a break now before the next session start. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're now done for uh, for this uh, this session. I thank you all for your time, and uh, I'm sorry you can't hear the audience uh, applaud, but uh, we do appreciate uh, uh, everyone who's uh, spoken today. Thank you. Thank you all.